Hyper P, Code Red, Apple learned a new phrase. AI, 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 AI to fast 5G cellular. 5G, AI, 5G, 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 AI to stroke victim. AI, AI, 5G, AI, 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 AI. Nothing gets me out of bed at 6 a.m. quite like an iPad keynote. Please subscribe. Mr. Cook wasn't shy about hyping this thing up, stating that it was going to be the biggest day for iPad since its unveiling, which made me think almost immediately, no, surely they won't talk about upcoming software features prior to WWDC, right? I mean, Final Cut Pro and Logic Pro, those were rumored for years, meant to stand as surefire proof that the iPad was a serious computer. But even that was reduced to a simple press release last year, a press release. So the biggest day ever, this is gonna be huge. There was some very neat stuff that we'll talk about, but biggest day ever, come on. You released two new iPads and one of them is basically the same as the old one. In any case, we did get adjustments to the entire iPad lineup. The 10th gen iPad, while not updated, did receive a $100 price drop to 350 bucks. And I think that this is actually, in fact, a rather big deal. As you may recall, this did not replace the 9th gen iPad when it launched. And a lot of people wrote this thing off as misguided, lost, and while the memes about the lightning pencil on a USB-C iPad with a dongle and all were surely deserved and quite funny, it was a good device. I mean, we reviewed it quite positively and it's still the iPad that my wife Megan uses on the daily. The two biggest problems it had have been fixed. The 9th gen iPad is now gone. So this is the new cheap iPad. And the $79 USB-C charged Apple Pencil that released last year does dock seamlessly onto the side of this thing. It's a good iPad and it now has a good price. My beloved iPad mini is not real and Apple forgot about it again. But the iPad Air did receive an update. The front camera has moved from the top to the side following the 10th gen iPad's footsteps, and it moved from an M1 to an M2. So by consequence, it inherits Wi-Fi 6E and faster memory bandwidth, which on a device like an iPad should actually make a real world difference in performance under certain tasks. But other than that, I mean, the screens are identical, despite the product naming suggesting otherwise, the cameras are identical, battery life and dimensions are identical, and supported accessories are nearly identical. The Air remains compatible and only compatible with the last gen Magic Keyboard, which looks like a very poor value when compared to the newly released but identically priced iPad Pro keyboard. More on that in a minute. However, it does inherit support for the new Apple Pencil Pro. Again, hang on a sec on that one. In addition to bringing over hover support, which debuted on the last gen iPad Pro, you can take all those specs and then just put them in a slightly larger body and bada boom, bada bing, you got yourself a larger iPad Air. Yes, there is now a 13 inch model with identical specifications. And you know what? I think that's great. Lots of older folks in particular love the larger iPads, but it has always been relegated to the more expensive and most powerful model, which is just silly. Like the 15 inch MacBook Air, this is a recognition that more screen real estate doesn't necessitate more oomph. It's a great move. Uh, the 11 inch keeps the same starting price point while ditching the awful 64 gig capacity. And the 13 inch comes in at an extra $200. Nice. Now we get to the real star of the show, the seventh gen iPad Pro. The already thin iPad shaves off both 100 grams and one millimeter of thickness, making it officially the thinnest Apple product ever made. In fact, they're already running ads comparing it to the old iPod Nano, the prior standard bearer in thinness, which is absolutely delightful. Much of this is enabled by the real flagship feature of these devices, the so-called Ultra Retina XDR display. Now, goofy marketing name aside, this OLED display is a big deal because it's the first commercially available tandem OLED ever. And tandem OLED is not just some term Apple made up, this is an industry definition. When two or more OLED displays are stacked on top of each other that are separated by charge generation layers. The benefits to this design are multifold. For starters, you can simply get more light output because current densities required to reach peak brightness are lowered. And these displays do that. They get to a mind-blowing 1,000 nits full screen brightness in both SDR and HDR, and up to 1,600 nits peak brightness, which blows essentially every other OLED on the market completely out of the water. This efficiency principle, though, holds also true in the other direction. 
because the device can produce more light for a given amount of electrical charge, it can also excel in conserving battery when outputting lower luminance. Additionally, less strain on the organic diodes in the display itself also suggests improved display lifetime, which is nice, and even lower likelihood of potential burn-in, which is fantastic. The theoretical issues with stacking displays has always been what's called reduced LEE, or low light extraction efficiency. And it's kind of exactly what it sounds like. Because the optical modes that make up the display have a greater refractive index than air itself, much of the light that is produced by the OLED panel is kind of just lost inside of the waveguide mode and other layers due to internal reflections. Now, there have been a bunch of proposed solutions in research papers found scattered across the web that try to fix this issue. There's corrugated substrates, embedded scattering layers, micro lens arrays have been proposed, and more, each with varying levels of potential improvement, but also added manufacturing difficulty. And as recently as even just a few years ago, these were largely theoretical. <laughs> so it's not yet publicly known what method Apple is using to improve light extraction efficiency on their tandem OLED screens. However, the, uh, the thinness and the weight reduction in this new iPad, which yes, is in part due to the thinner and lighter display panel, but also likely due to just simply smaller batteries that advertise the same runtime on the website, really suggest that there's a pretty excellent baseline efficiency here that is probably only going to get better in subsequent generations of this panel technology. It's really exciting stuff. And if I lost you there for a minute, basically what I'm saying is that this is eventually gonna come to the rest of Apple's Pro lineup over the next many, many years, and it's a big deal. <laughs> now, another key to efficiency on the iPad is the new M4. It's the first time that Apple has debuted new silicon, not just alongside the iPad, but exclusively for the iPad. However, I actually think that it makes a lot of sense. Think about it. I mean, the outgoing iPad Pro, it already had the M2. So its option was M3 or M4. And as I already explained at the launch of M3's debut, it was never going to be a long-term solution that would make it into the majority of Apple's lineup because they were the sole customer of TSMC's extremely expensive N3B, Bravo, stopgap process generation that goes in between five nanometer and kind of mass market three nanometer, which is called N3E Echo, which will be utilized by NVIDIA, Apple, uh, AMD, basically everyone. And while not 100% confirmed, it's basically certain that this M4 is one of TSMC's first N3E chips, which promises higher yields, better computational performance, improved power efficiency, but most importantly, lower production costs than the M3 chip on the old M3B process. So don't color yourself surprised when M4 doesn't blow the barely six month old M3 chip out of the water. In fact, nary even once did Apple compare the two. Now, an Apple apologist might say, well, there was no M3 iPad, so of course they're not going to compare it to the new M4 iPads. But I might just smile and suggest that this was by design all along, because with the same GPU engine, which they did say was identical, and an estimated CPU increase of maybe 5 to 10%, the M4 is a necessary strategic leap. It's not a computational leap. An M4, unlike the M3 and M2 before it, it will be the chip to make it into every single product that Apple's lineup is rumored to receive, especially considering the thing that is the big deal about the M4, and that is the new neural engine. I literally just made a video on why this is important for Apple's AI aspirations a few days ago, and you should go watch it if you haven't seen it yet. Last thing to note, while the efficiency core count increased by two to a total of six, there is for the first time ever a huge gap in specs based on the storage configuration that you select. It's not like the Mac, but just like last time, RAM, that's tied to your storage choice. Okay, so 256, 512 gig options, those come with eight gigs of memory. If you opt for a terabyte or two terabytes of storage, you get 16 gigs of RAM. Um, that mostly comes down to like controllers and stuff like that. That happened in the last generation, that isn't new. What is new, however, is that the lower capacity models, those come with what is certainly a binned chip with one of the four performance cores on the M4 disabled. This is in addition to the memory, which may mean huge real world performance gaps between the 512 gig and one terabyte models under certain workloads. This is also likely the reason that Apple's charging a massive $500 to upgrade between those two middle tiers, because this isn't just 512 gigs of flash, it's also double the memory and a full hog, non-defective M4, which are likely in low supply. Additionally, 
Furthermore, <laughs> the very cheapest lowest end model on the iPad Pro lineup, it cannot no longer record 4K video at the same frame rate as the generation before it. This likely comes down to the fact that it's using a single 256 gig NAND chip instead of two 128s, which was in the generation prior. So while messy, on the whole, this looks like a pretty good jump in performance. But what else is new on the iPad Pro? Well, you lose the ultra wide camera, <laughs> which I actually think is fine because it was crappy anyways, and you really only need the main sensor for most stuff you're gonna do with an iPad rear camera. However, I did find it ironic after them showing the new Final Cut Pro update that allows you to DP multicam feeds from nearby iPhones and iPads. I mean, the outgoing iPad is a better camera than the new iPad, and that's just weird. Also weird, pricing. Both models get a big jump in price of $200 to $999 and $1,299 starting prices respectively. Now that may be forgivable with a higher base storage and the incredible new display, but the $300 price delta between the two models was introduced in 2021 when the 13 inch iPad Pro got the fancy pants mini LED screen and the 11 inch just stuck with the old LCD. Now, both models have that same amazing tandem OLED display, and charging $300 just to increase screen size seems like a bit of a jerk move, especially when the price jump on the air between sizes is only $200. Uh, there's a new Magic Keyboard. It appears to have the same grippy rubber texture on the outside, but the inside now houses an aluminum keyboard deck. There's a function row and a larger trackpad with haptic support on the inside. Thank goodness. The diving board trackpad on the old one, it felt so crappy after using a MacBook for any extended period of time. And the addition of a function row, in my opinion, is a big win. Now, they still had to put creepy little tiny keys to make stuff fit on the 11 inch model. However, I think that it looks like a nice improvement overall. And the pricing hasn't changed from the prior generation, which is nice. Although still overpriced. I mean, 350 bucks, whew. Also, it appears that the USB-C port remains useful for only very slow pass-through charging through the pins on the back of the iPad, which, while unsurprising, is a bit of a disappointment. Okay, now we get to the Apple Pencil Pro. Compatible with both the new iPad Air and iPad Pro, this thing now has a force-based barrel sensor, which allows you to squeeze the barrel of the pencil, which in Apple's app springs up this kind of secondary menu and can act as a multifunction gesture in third-party apps that developers can take advantage of. Now, when you squeeze that pencil, there's a haptic motor at the end that vibrates in confirmation, which is nice. More impressive to me though, and apparently to the few artists that are still using Wacom tablets, there's now a gyroscopic rotational sensor. So you can actually adjust the orientation of shaped brushes and pens by moving the pencil in your fingers. This barrel roll feature seems like a huge deal to artists and definitely gets closer to simulating real art tools. Last, and perhaps most exciting to me as someone who has lost an Apple Pencil, only to find it six months later after already buying a replacement, is Find My Support. Surprisingly, uh, it maintains the same $129 price tag, which while egregious when launched many, many years ago and before years of inflation and all that stuff, now actually seems like a pretty decent value considering everything that you're getting in this thing. It is almost its own computer. Unfortunately, the Pencil lineup, it's just as disastrous as ever. But Earth is healing, and the end of the line has absolutely been shown towards the first and second generation pencils. All that being said, if you, like me, own a 2018 or later iPad Pro, it appears that your pencil will not work on the new Pro or Air. It just sucks, man. You're gonna have to pony up for uh, the new Pencil Pro or go out and buy a more feature-limited USB-C pencil versus the one you've already got. Oh, and by the way, that's not because of the hover feature thing, because that was already a thing in the last generation Pro with the second gen pencil. So it's possibly a technological limitation, but it kind of just feels like they're trying to screw you. Last, we get to the new iPad OS, which was not mentioned at all. There's gonna be oodles of comments on Twitter, this video, and the internet as a whole, talking about how the iPad's hardware is completely overkill, because well, iPad OS is for babies, it's hyper limited. I would suggest that the people that are saying that consider the fact that the iPad Pro is exactly what some people want and need. Digital artists, musicians, 3D modelers, and more will buy this thing in droves. And just because it may not suit your workload or mine doesn't mean that it's useless or limited to everybody. I mean, don't forget, Apple sells more iPads than they do Macs. For a lot of people, this is the perfect computer. And if you're like me, where it's kinda not, 
Maybe WWDC will elevate it for us, but I don't know why anybody expected software features to be announced today. That's not how Apple works. Look, the like button, that thing works by you hovering your finger or mouse over the top of it and pressing it. <laughs> so dumb. What are you most excited for from today's event? Did you uh, order the new iPads? What else do you think is in store for the M4? What are you excited about for WWDC? It's coming, it's like a month away. Let me know in the comments down below. And as always, stay snazzy.